Postcolonialism or postcolonial studies is the academic study of the cultural legacy of colonialism and imperialism, focusing on the human consequences of the control and exploitation of colonized people and their lands. Postcolonialism is a critical theory analysis of the history, culture, literature, and discourse of European imperial power. The name postcolonialism is modeled on postmodernism, with which it shares certain concepts and methods, and may be thought of as a reaction to or departure from colonialism in the same way postmodernism is a reaction to modernism. The ambiguous term colonialism may refer either to a system of government or to an ideology or worldview underlying that system. In general postcolonialism represents an ideological response to colonialist thought, rather than simply describing a system that comes after colonialism. The term postcolonial studies may be preferred for this reason. Postcolonialism encompasses a wide variety of approaches, and theoreticians may not always agree on a common set of definitions. On a simple level, it may seek through anthropological study to build a better understanding of colonial life from the point of view of the colonized people, based on the assumption that the colonial rulers are unreliable narrators. On a deeper level, postcolonialism examines the social and political power relationships that sustain colonialism and neocolonialism, including the social, political and cultural narratives surrounding the colonizer and the colonized. This approach may overlap with contemporary history and critical theory, and may also draw examples from history, political science, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, and human geography. Subdisciplines of postcolonial studies examine the effects of colonial rule on the practice of feminism, anarchism, literature and Christian thought. Topic. Purpose and basic concepts As an epistemology, the study of knowledge, its nature and verifiability, as an ethics, moral philosophy, and as a politics, affairs of the citizenry, the field of postcolonialism addresses the politics of knowledge the matters that constitute the postcolonial identity of a decolonized people, which derives from, I, the colonizer's generation of cultural knowledge about the colonized people, and I, I, how that Western cultural knowledge was applied to subjugate a non-European people into a colony of the European mother country, which, after initial invasion, was affected by means of the cultural identities of colonizer and colonized. Postcolonialism is aimed at destabilizing these theories intellectual and linguistic, social and economic by means of which colonialists perceive, understand, and know the world. Postcolonial theory thus establishes intellectual spaces for subaltern peoples to speak for themselves, in their own voices, and thus produce cultural discourses of philosophy, language, society and economy, balancing the imbalancedness and binary power relationship between the colonist and the colonial subjects. Topic. Colonialist discourse Colonialism was presented as the extension of civilization, which ideologically justified the self-ascribed racial and cultural superiority of the Western world over the non-Western world. This concept was espoused by Joseph Ernest Renan in La Réforme intellectuelle et morale 1871, whereby imperial stewardship was thought to affect the intellectual and moral reformation of the colored peoples of the lesser cultures of the world. That such a divinely established, natural harmony among the human races of the world would be possible, because everyone has an assigned cultural identity, a social place, and an economic role within an imperial colony. Thus, the regeneration of the inferior or degenerate races, by the superior races is part of the providential order of things for humanity. Reger imperio populus is our vocation. Pour forth this all-consuming activity onto countries, which like China, are crying aloud for foreign conquest. Turn the adventurers who disturb European society into a verse sacrum, a horde like those of the Franks, the Lombards, or the Normans, and every man will be in his right role. 
nature has made a race of workers, the Chinese race, who have wonderful manual dexterity, and almost no sense of honor, govern them with justice, levying from them, in return for the blessing of such a government, an ample allowance for the conquering race, and they will be satisfied, a race of tillers of the soil, the Negro, treat him with kindness and humanity, and all will be as it should, a race of masters and soldiers, the European race. Let each do what he is made for, and all will be well. From the mid to the late 19th century, such racialist group identity language was the cultural common currency justifying geopolitical competition amongst the European and American empires and meant to protect their overextended economies. Especially in the colonization of the Far East and in the late 19th century scramble for Africa, the representation of a homogeneous European identity justified colonization. Hence, Belgium and Britain, and France and Germany proffered theories of national superiority that justified colonialism as delivering the light of civilization to unenlightened peoples. Notably, La Mission Civilisatrice, the self-ascribed, civilising mission of the French Empire, proposed that some races and cultures have a higher purpose in life, whereby the more powerful, more developed, and more civilised races have the right to colonise other peoples, in service to the noble idea of civilization and its economic benefits. Post-colonial identity Decolonized people develop a postcolonial identity that is based on cultural interactions between different identities cultural, national, and ethnic as well as gender and class-based which are assigned varying degrees of social power by the colonial society. In postcolonial literature, the anti-conquest narrative analyzes the identity politics that are the social and cultural perspectives of the subaltern colonial subjects their creative resistance to the culture of the colonizer, how such cultural resistance complicated the establishment of a colonial society, how the colonizers developed their post-colonial identity, and how neo-colonialism actively employs the us and them binary social relation to view the non-Western world as inhabited by the other. The neocolonial discourse of geopolitical homogeneity relegating the decolonized peoples, their cultures, and their countries, to an imaginary place, such as the Third World, an over-inclusive term that usually comprises continents and seas, i.e. Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Oceania. The postcolonial critique analyzes the self-justifying discourse of neo-colonialism and the functions, philosophic and political, of its over-inclusive terms, to establish a factual and cultural inaccuracy of homogeneous concepts, such as the Arabs and the First World, Christendom, and the Ummah actually comprise heterogeneous peoples, cultures, and geography, and that accurate descriptions of the world's peoples, places, and things require nuanced and accurate terms. Topic. Difficulty of definition As a contemporary history term, postcolonialism occasionally is applied temporally, to denote the immediate time after colonialism, which is a problematic application of the term, because the immediate, historical, political time is not included in the categories of critical identity discourse, which deals with over-inclusive terms of cultural representation, which are abrogated and replaced by postcolonial criticism. As such, the terms postcolonial and postcolonialism denote aspects of the subject matter, which indicate that the decolonized world is an intellectual space of contradictions, of half-finished processes, of confusions, of hybridity, and of liminalities. In postcolonial drama, theory, practice, politics 1996, Helen Gilbert and Joanne Tompkins clarified the denotational functions, among which the term postcolonialism, according to a too rigid etymology, is frequently misunderstood as a temporal concept, meaning the time after colonialism has ceased, or the time following the politically determined independence day on which a country breaks away from its governance by another state. 
not a naive teleological sequence, which supersedes colonialism. Post colonialism is, rather, an engagement with, and contestation of, colonialism's discourses, power structures, and social hierarchies. A theory of post colonialism must, then, respond to more than the merely chronological construction of post independence, and to more than just the discursive experience of imperialism. The term post-colonialism is also applied to denote the mother country's neocolonial control of the decolonized country, affected by the legalistic continuation of the economic, cultural, and linguistic power relationships that control the colonial politics of knowledge, the generation, production, and distribution of knowledge about the colonized peoples of the non-Western world. The cultural and religious assumptions of colonialist logic remain active practices in contemporary society, and are the basis of the mother country's neocolonial attitude towards her former colonial subjects—an economical source of labor and raw materials. Notable theoreticians Topic. France Fanon In The Wretched of the Earth 1961, the psychiatrist and philosopher France Fanon analyzed and medically described the nature of colonialism as essentially destructive. Its societal effects—the imposition of a subjugating colonial identity—are harmful to the mental health of the native peoples who were subjugated into colonies. Fanon wrote the ideological essence of colonialism is the systematic denial of all attributes of humanity by the colonized people. Such dehumanization is achieved with physical and mental violence, by which a colonist means to inculcate a servile mentality upon the natives. For Fanon the natives must violently resist colonial subjugation. Hence, Fanon describes violent resistance to colonialism as a mentally cathartic practice, which purges colonial servility from the native psyche, and restores self-respect to the subjugated. Thus, Fanon actively supported and participated in the Algerian Revolution 1954 for independence from France as a member and representative of the Front de Liberation Nationale. As post colonial praxis, Fanon's mental health analyses of colonialism and imperialism, and the supporting economic theories, were partly derived from the essay Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, 1916, wherein Vladimir Lenin described colonialism imperialism as a degenerate form of capitalism, which requires greater degrees of human exploitation to ensure continually consistent profit for investment. Edward Said Cultural critic Edward Said is considered by E. San Juan Jr. as the originator and inspiring patron saint of post-colonial theory and discourse", due to his theory of Orientalism explained in his 1978 book of the same name. To describe the us and them, binary social relation, with which Western Europe intellectually divided the world—into the Occident and the Orient. Said developed the denotations and connotations of the term Orientalism an art history term for Western depictions and the study of the Orient. Said's concept which he also termed Orientalism is that the cultural representations generated with the us and them binary relation are social constructs, which are mutually constitutive and cannot exist independent of each other, because each exists on account of and for the other, notably the West created the cultural concept of the East, which according to said allowed the Europeans to suppress the peoples of the Middle East, of the Indian subcontinent, and of Asia, from expressing and representing themselves as discrete peoples and cultures. Orientalism thus conflated and reduced the non-Western world into the homogeneous cultural entity known as the East. Therefore, in service to the colonial type of imperialism, the Usanum Orientalist paradigm allowed European scholars to represent the Oriental world as inferior and backward, irrational and wild, as opposed to a Western Europe that was superior and progressive, rational and civil—the opposite of the Oriental other. 
in Edward Said, The Exile as Interpreter, 1993, about Said's Orientalism, 1978, A. Madhavan said that Said's passionate thesis in that book, now an almost canonical study, represented Orientalism as a style of thought based on the antinomy of East and West in their world views, and also as a corporate institution for dealing with the Orient. In concordance with the philosopher Michel Foucault, Said established that power and knowledge are the inseparable components of the intellectual binary relationship with which Occidentals claim knowledge of the Orient. That the applied power of such cultural knowledge allowed Europeans to rename, redefine, and thereby control Oriental peoples, places, and things, into imperial colonies. The power-knowledge binary relation is conceptually essential to identify and understand colonialism in general, and European colonialism in particular. Hence, to the extent that Western scholars were aware of contemporary Orientals or Oriental movements of thought and culture, these were perceived either as silent shadows to be animated by the Orientalist, brought into reality by them, or as a kind of cultural and international proletariat useful for the Orientalist's grander interpretive activity. Nonetheless, critics of the homogeneous Occident -Orient Binary social relation, said that Orientalism is of limited descriptive capability and practical application, and proposed that there are variants of Orientalism that apply to Africa and to Latin America. Said replied that the European West applied Orientalism as a homogeneous form of the other, in order to facilitate the formation of the cohesive, collective European cultural identity denoted by the term, the West. With this described binary logic, the West generally constructs the Orient subconsciously as its alter ego. Therefore, descriptions of the Orient by the Occident lack material attributes, grounded within land. This inventive, or imaginative interpretation subscribes female characteristics to the Orient and plays into fantasies that are inherent within the West's alter ego. It should be understood that this process draws creativity, amounting an entire domain and discourse. In Orientalism, Said mentions the production of philology, the study of the history of languages, lexicography, dictionary making, history, biology, political and economic theory, novel writing, and lyric poetry. P. 6. Therefore, there is an entire industry that exploits the Orient for its own subjective purposes that lack a native and intimate understanding. Such industries become institutionalized and eventually become a resource for manifest Orientalism, or a compilation of misinformation about the Orient. The ideology of empire was hardly ever a brute jingoism, rather, it made subtle use of reason, and recruited science and history to serve its ends. Imperial fictions, Europe's myths of Orient p. 6. These subjective fields of academia now synthesize the political resources and think tanks that are so common in the West today. Orientalism is self-perpetuating to the extent that it becomes normalized within common discourse, making people say things that are latent, impulsive, or not fully conscious of its own self. Topic. Gayatri Spivak In establishing the postcolonial definition of the term subaltern, the philosopher and theoretician Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak cautioned against assigning an overbroad connotation. She argues, Subaltern is not just a classy word for oppressed, for the other, for somebody who's not getting a piece of the pie. In post-colonial terms, everything that has limited or no access to the cultural imperialism is subaltern, a spacer difference. Now, who would say that's just the oppressed? The working class is oppressed. It's not subaltern. Many people want to claim subalternity. They are the least interesting and the most dangerous. I mean, just by being a discriminated against minority on the university campus, they don't need the word, subaltern. They should see what the mechanics of the discrimination are. They're within the hegemonic discourse, wanting a piece of the pie, and not being allowed, so let them speak, use the hegemonic discourse. They should not call themselves subaltern. 
Spivak also introduced the terms essentialism and strategic essentialism to describe the social functions of postcolonialism. The term essentialism denotes the perceptual dangers inherent to reviving subaltern voices in ways that might over simplify the cultural identity of heterogeneous social groups and, thereby, create stereotyped representations of the different identities of the people who compose a given social group. The term strategic essentialism denotes a temporary, essential group identity used in the praxis of discourse among peoples. Furthermore, essentialism can occasionally be applied by the so described people to facilitate the subaltern's communication in being heeded, heard, and understood because a strategic essentialism, a fixed and established subaltern identity, is more readily grasped and accepted by the popular majority in the course of intergroup discourse. The important distinction, between the terms, is that strategic essentialism does not ignore the diversity of identities cultural and ethnic in a social group, but that, in its practical function, strategic essentialism temporarily minimizes intergroup diversity to pragmatically support the essential group identity. Spivak developed and applied Foucault's term epistemic violence to describe the destruction of non-Western ways of perceiving the world and the resultant dominance of the Western ways of perceiving the world. Conceptually, epistemic violence specifically relates to women, whereby the subaltern woman must always be caught in translation, never allowed to be truly expressing herself. Because the colonial power's destruction of her culture pushed to the social margins her non-Western ways of perceiving, understanding, and knowing the world, in June of the year 1600, the Afro-Iberian woman Francisca de Figueroa requested from the King of Spain his permission for her to emigrate from Europe to New Spain, and reunite with her daughter, Juana de Figueroa. As a subaltern woman, Francisca repressed her native African language, and spoke her request in Peninsular Spanish, the official language of colonial Latin America. As a subaltern woman, she applied to her voice the Spanish cultural filters of sexism, Christian monotheism, and servile language, in addressing her colonial master. I, Francisca de Figueroa, mulata in color, declare that I have, in the city of Cartagena, a daughter named Juana de Figueroa, and she has written, to call for me, in order to help me. I will take with me, in my company, a daughter of mine, her sister, named Maria, of the said color, and for this, I must write to our lord the king to petition that he favor me with a license, so that I, and my said daughter, can go and reside in the said city of Cartagena. For this, I will give an account of what is put down in this report, and of how I, Francisca de Figueroa, am a woman of sound body, and mulatta in color, and my daughter Maria is twenty years old, and of the said color, and of medium size. Once given, I attest to this. I beg your lordship to approve, and order it done. I ask for justice in this. On the 21st day of the month of June 1600, Your Majesty's Lords Presidents and Official Judges of this House of Contract Employment order that the account she offers be received, and that testimony for the purpose she requests given. Moreover, Spivak further cautioned against ignoring subaltern peoples as cultural others, and said that the West could progress beyond the colonial perspective by means of introspective self-criticism of the basic ideals and investigative methods that establish a culturally superior West studying the culturally inferior non-Western peoples. Hence, the integration of the subaltern voice to the intellectual spaces of social studies is problematic, because of the unrealistic opposition to the idea of studying others. Spivak rejected such an anti-intellectual stance by social scientists, and about them said that to refuse to represent a cultural other is solving your conscience, allowing you not to do any homework." Moreover, postcolonial studies also reject the colonial cultural depiction of subaltern peoples as hollow mimics of the European colonists and their Western ways, and rejects the depiction of subaltern peoples as the passive recipient vessels of the imperial and colonial power of the mother country. Consequent to Foucault's philosophic model of the binary relationship of power and knowledge, scholars from the Subaltern Studies Collective, proposed that anti-colonial resistance always counters every exercise of colonial power. <laughs> 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 
Topic: Homi K Baba In the location of culture, 1994, the theoretician Homi K. Baba argued that viewing the human world as composed of separate and unequal cultures, rather than as an integral human world, perpetuates the belief in the existence of imaginary peoples and places, Christendom, and the Islamic world, the first world, the second world, and the third world. To counter such linguistic and sociologic reductionism, postcolonial praxis establishes the philosophic value of hybrid intellectual spaces, wherein ambiguity abrogates truth and authenticity, thereby, hybridity is the philosophic condition that most substantively challenges the ideological validity of colonialism. R. Shiva Kumar In 1997, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of India's independence, Santiniketan, the making of a contextual modernism was an important exhibition curated by Arshiva Kumar at the National Gallery of Modern Art. In his catalogue essay, Kumar introduced the term contextual modernism, which later emerged as a post-colonial critical tool in the understanding of Indian art, specifically the works of Nandalal Bose, Rabindranath Tagore, Ramkankar B. A. I.J. and Benod Bihari Mukherjee. Santiniketan artists did not believe that to be indigenous one has to be historicist either in theme or in style, and similarly to be modern one has to adopt a particular trans-national formal language or technique. Modernism was to them neither a style nor a form of internationalism. It was critical re-engagement with the foundational aspects of art necessitated by changes in one's unique historical position. In the post-colonial history of art, this marked the departure from Eurocentric unilateral idea of modernism to alternative context-sensitive modernisms. The brief survey of the individual works of the core Santiniketan artists and the thought perspectives they open up makes clear that though there were various contact points in the work they were not bound by a continuity of style but by a community of ideas, which they not only shared but also interpreted and carried forward. Thus they do not represent a school but a movement. Several terms including Paul Gilroy's counter-culture of modernity and Tani E. Barlow's colonial modernity have been used to describe the kind of alternative modernity that emerged in non-European contexts. Professor Gall argues that contextual modernism is a more suited term because the colonial in colonial modernity does not accommodate the refusal of many in colonized situations to internalize inferiority. Santiniketan's artist-teacher's refusal of subordination incorporated a counter-vision of modernity, which sought to correct the racial and cultural essentialism that drove and characterized imperial Western modernity and modernism. Those European modernities, projected through a triumphant British colonial power, provoked nationalist responses, equally problematic when they incorporated similar essentialisms. Topic. Dipesh Chakrabarti In Provincializing Europe 2000, Dipesh Chakrabarti charted the subaltern history of the Indian struggle for independence, and countered Eurocentric, Western scholarship about non-Western peoples and cultures, by proposing that Western Europe simply be considered as culturally equal to the other cultures of the world, that is, as one region among many in human geography. Topic. Derek Gregory Derek Gregory argues the long trajectory through history of British and American colonization is an ongoing process still happening today. In the colonial present, Gregory traces connections between the geopolitics of events happening in modern-day Afghanistan, Palestine, and Iraq and links it back to the Usanam binary relation between the Western and Eastern world. Building upon the ideas of the other and said's work on Orientalism, Gregory critiques the economic policy, military apparatus, and transnational corporations as vehicles driving present-day colonialism. 
Emphasizing ideas or discussing ideas around colonialism in the present tense, Gregory utilizes modern events such as the September 11 attacks to tell spatial stories around the colonial behavior happening due to the War on Terror. Topic. Amar Asherayu Asherayu argues that colonialism was a capitalist venture moved by appropriation and plundering of foreign lands and was supported by military force and a discourse that legitimized violence in the name of progress and a universal civilizing mission. This discourse is complex and multifaceted. It was elaborated in the 19th century by colonial ideologues such as Joseph Ernest Renan and Arthur de Gobineau, but its roots reach far back in history. In Rethinking Postcolonialism, Colonialist Discourse in Modern Literature and the Legacy of Classical Writers, Amar Asherayu discusses the history of colonialist discourse and traces its spirit to ancient Greece, including Europe's claim to racial supremacy and right to rule over non-Europeans harbored by Renan and other 19th-century colonial ideologues. He argues that modern colonial representations of the colonized as inferior stagnant and degenerate were borrowed from Greek and Latin authors like Lysias 440 to 380 BC, Isocrates 436 to 338 BC, Plato 427 to 327 BC, Aristotle 384 322 BC, Cicero 106 to 43 BC, and Sallust 86 to 34 BC, who all considered their racial others, the Persians, Scythians, Egyptians as backward, inferior, and effeminate. Among these ancient writers Aristotle is the one who articulated more thoroughly these ancient racial assumptions, which served as a source of inspiration for modern colonists. In the politics, he established a racial classification and ranked the Greeks superior to the rest. He considered them as an ideal race to rule over Asian and other barbarian peoples, for they knew how to blend the spirit of the European warlike races with Asiatic intelligence and competence. Ancient Rome was a source of admiration in Europe since the Enlightenment. In France, Voltaire (1694–1778) was one of the most fervent admirers of Rome. He regarded highly the Roman Republican values of rationality, democracy, order, and justice. In early 18th-century Britain, it was poets and politicians like Joseph Addison (1672–1719) and Richard Glover (1712–1785) who were vocal advocates of these ancient Republican values. It was in the mid-18th century that ancient Greece became a source of admiration among the French and British. This enthusiasm gained prominence in the late 18th century. It was spurred by German Hellenist scholars and English Romantic poets, Johann Joachim Winckelmann 1717 Wilhelm von Humboldt 1767 and Goethe 1749 Lord Byron 1788 Samuel Taylor Coleridge 1772 Percy Bysshe Shelley 1792 and John Keats 1795–1821. These scholars and poets regarded ancient Greece as the matrix of Western civilization and a model of beauty and democracy. In the 19th century, when Europe began to expand across the globe and establish colonies, ancient Greece and Rome were used as a source of empowerment and justification to Western civilizing mission. At this period, many French and British imperial ideologues identified strongly with the ancient empires and invoked ancient Greece and Rome to justify the colonial civilizing project. They urged European colonizers to emulate these «ideal» classical conquerors, whom they regarded as «universal instructors». For Alexis de Tocqueville (1805–1859), an ardent and influential advocate of la Grand France. The classical empires were model conquerors to imitate. He advised the French colonists in Algeria to follow the ancient imperial example. 
In 1841, he stated, What matters most when we want to set up and develop a colony is to make sure that those who arrive in it are as less estranged as possible, that these newcomers meet a perfect image of their homeland. The thousand colonies that the Greeks founded on the Mediterranean coasts were all exact copies of the Greek cities on which they had been modelled. The Romans established in almost all parts of the globe known to them municipalities which were no more than miniature Romes. Among modern colonizers, the English did the same. Who can prevent us from emulating these European peoples? The Greeks and Romans were deemed exemplary conquerors and «heuristic teachers» whose lessons were invaluable for modern colonists' ideologues. John Robert Seeley (1834–1895), a history professor at Cambridge and proponent of imperialism, stated in a rhetoric which echoed that of Renan that the role of the British Empire was similar to that of Rome, in which we hold the position of not merely of ruling but of an educating and civilizing race. The incorporation of ancient concepts and racial and cultural assumptions into modern imperial ideology bolstered colonial claims to supremacy and right to colonize non-Europeans. Because of these numerous ramifications between ancient representations and modern colonial rhetoric, 19th century's colonialist discourse acquires a multi-layered or palimpsestic structure. It forms a historical, ideological and narcissistic continuum, in which modern theories of domination feed upon and blend with ancient myths of supremacy and grandeur. <laughs> Postcolonial literary study As a literary theory, postcolonialism deals with the literatures produced by the peoples who once were colonies of the European imperial powers e.g. Britain, France, and Spain and the literatures of the decolonized countries engaged in contemporary, postcolonial arrangements e.g. Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie and the Commonwealth of Nations with their former mother countries. Postcolonial literary criticism comprehends the literatures written by the colonizer and the colonized, wherein the subject matter includes portraits of the colonized peoples and their lives as imperial subjects. In Dutch literature, the Indies literature includes the colonial and postcolonial genres, which examine and analyze the formation of a postcolonial identity, and the postcolonial culture produced by the diaspora of the Indo European peoples, the Eurasian folk who originated from Indonesia, the peoples who were the colony of the Dutch East Indies. In the literature, the notable author is Jali Robinson. J. M. Kutsi's Waiting for the Barbarians 1980, depicts the unfair and inhuman human situation of people dominated by settlers. To perpetuate and facilitate control of the colonial enterprise, some colonized people, especially from among the subaltern peoples of the British Empire, were sent to attend university in the imperial motherland, they were to become the native-born, but Europeanized, ruling class of colonial satraps. Yet, after decolonization, their bicultural educations originated post-colonial criticism of empire and colonialism, and of the representations of the colonist and the colonized. In the late 20th century, after the dissolution of the USSR 1991, the constituent Soviet socialist republics became the literary subjects of post-colonial criticism, wherein the writers dealt with the legacies cultural, social, economic of the Russification of their peoples, countries, and cultures in service to Greater Russia. Postcolonial literary study is in two categories, I, that of the postcolonial nations, and I, I, that of the nations who continue forging a post-colonial national identity. The first category of literature presents and analyzes the internal challenges inherent to determining an ethnic identity in a decolonized nation. The second category of literature presents and analyzes the degeneration of civic and nationalist unities consequent to ethnic parochialism, usually manifested as the demagoguery of protecting the nation, a variant of the us and them binary social relation. Civic and national unity degenerate when a patriarchal regime unilaterally defines what is and what is not the national culture, 
of a decolonized country, the nation-state collapses, either into communal movements, espousing grand political goals for the post-colonial nation, or into ethnically mixed communal movements, espousing political separatism, as occurred in decolonized Rwanda, the Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, thus the post-colonial extremes against which Franz Fanon warned in 1961. Regarding sociolinguistic interpretations of literary texts through postcolonial lenses we may refer to Jadeep Sarangi's book, Indian Novels in English, A Sociolinguistic Study 2005. Topic. Application Topic. The Middle East In the essays, Overstating the Arab State, 2001, by Nazi Ayubi, and Is Jordan Palestine? 2003, by Raphael Israel, the authors deal with the psychologically fragmented postcolonial identity, as determined by the effects political and social, cultural and economic of Western colonialism in the Middle East. As such, the fragmented national identity remains a characteristic of such societies, consequence of the imperially convenient, but arbitrary, colonial boundaries geographic and cultural demarcated by the Europeans, with which they ignored the tribal and clan relations that determined the geographic borders of the Middle East countries, before the arrival of European imperialists. Hence, the postcolonial literature about the Middle East examines and analyzes the Western discourses about identity formation, the existence and inconsistent nature of a postcolonial national identity among the peoples of the contemporary Middle East. In the essay, Who Am I? The Identity Crisis in the Middle East, 2006, P.R. Kumaraswamy said, most countries of the Middle East, suffered from the fundamental problems over their national identities. More than three quarters of a century after the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire, from which most of them emerged, these states have been unable to define, project, and maintain a national identity that is both inclusive and representative. Independence and the end of colonialism did not end social fragmentation and war, civil and international, in the Middle East. In the Search for Arab Democracy, Discourses and Counter-Discourses, 2004, Labi Sadiqi said that the problems of national identity in the Middle East are a consequence of the Orientalist indifference of the European empires when they demarcated the political borders of their colonies, which ignored the local history and the geographic and tribal boundaries observed by the natives, in the course of establishing the Western version of the Middle East. In the event, in places like Iraq and Jordan, leaders of the new sovereign states were brought in from the outside, and, tailored to suit colonial interests and commitments. Likewise, most states in the Persian Gulf were handed over to those Europeanized colonial subjects who could protect and safeguard imperial interests in the post-withdrawal phase. Moreover, with notable exceptions like Egypt, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, most countries have had to reinvent their historical roots after decolonization, and, like its colonial predecessor, postcolonial identity owes its existence to force. Africa In the late 19th century, the scramble for Africa 1874 proved to be the tail end of mercantilist colonialism of the European imperial powers, yet, for the Africans, the consequences were greater than elsewhere in the colonized non-Western world. To facilitate the colonization the European empires laid railroads where the rivers and the land proved impassable. The Imperial British Railroad effort proved overambitious in the effort of traversing continental Africa, yet succeeded only in connecting colonial North Africa Cairo with the colonial South of Africa Cape Town. 
Upon arriving to Africa, the Europeans encountered the native African civilizations of the Ashanti Empire, the Benin Empire, the Kingdom of Dahomey, the Buganda Kingdom, Uganda, and the Kingdom of Congo, all of which were annexed by imperial powers under the belief that they required European stewardship, as proposed and justified in the essay, The African Character. 1830, by G. W. F. Hegel, in keeping with his philosophic opinion that cultures were stages in the course of the historical unfolding of the Absolute. Nigeria was the homeland of the Hausa people, the Yoruba people and the Igbo people, which last were among the first people to develop their history in constructing a post-colonial identity. See, Things Fall Apart, 1958. About East Africa, the Kenyan writer Nugi W. A. Theongo wrote Weep Not, Child, 1964, the first postcolonial novel about the East African experience of colonial imperialism, in the river between 1965, with the Mau Mau Uprising, 1952-60. As political background, he addressed the postcolonial matters of native religious culture, and the consequences of the imposition of Christianity, a religion culturally foreign to Kenya and to most of Africa, and the essay Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language in African Literature, 1986. In postcolonial countries of Africa, the Africans and the non-Africans live in a world of genders, ethnicities, classes and languages, of ages, families, professions, religions and nations. There is a suggestion that individualism and postcolonialism are essentially discontinuous and divergent cultural phenomena. Topic. Asia French Indochina was divided into five subdivisions, Tonkin, Annam, Cochinchina, Cambodia and Lao, Cochinchina, Southern Vietnam, was the first territory under French control. Saigon was conquered in 1859. Then, in 1887, the Indochinese Union, Union Indochinoise was established. In 1924, Nguyen Ai Quoc Ho Chi Minh wrote the first critical text against the French colonization, Le Proces de la Colonisation Française, French Colonisation on Trial. Trinti Minh Ha has been developing her innovative theories about postcolonialism in various means of expression, literature, films, and teaching. She is best known for her film, Reassemblage made in 1982, in which she tried to deconstruct anthropology, as a «Western male hegemonic ideology». In 1989 she wrote, «Woman, Native, Other, Writing Postcoloniality and Feminism», where she focuses on the acknowledgement of oral tradition. <laughs> Structural Adjustment Programs SAPs. Structural Adjustment Programs SAPs, implemented by the World Bank and IMF are viewed by some postcolonialists as the modern procedure of colonization. Structural Adjustment Programs SAPs, calls for trade liberalization, privatization of banks, health care, and educational institutions. These implementations minimized government's role, paved pathways for companies to enter Africa for its resources. Limited to production and exportation of cash crops, many African nations acquired more debt, and were left stranded in a position where acquiring more loan and continuing to pay high interest became an endless cycle. Osterhamel's The Dictionary of Human Geography uses the definition of colonialism as enduring relationship of domination and mode of dispossession, usually or at least initially between an indigenous or enslaved majority and a minority of interlopers colonizers, who are convinced of their own superiority, pursue their own interests, and exercise power through a mixture of coercion, persuasion, conflict and collaboration. The definition adopted by the Dictionary of Human Geography suggests that the structural adjustment programs implemented by the Washington Consensus is indeed an act of colonization. Topic: Criticism. Topic: 
Undermining of universal values Indian Marxist scholar Vivek Chibba has critiqued some foundational logics of postcolonial theory in his book Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital. Developing on Ajaz Ahmad's earlier critique of Said's Orientalism and Sumit Sarkar's critique of the Subaltern Studies scholars. Chiba focuses on and refutes the principal historical claims made by the Subaltern Studies scholars, claims which are representative of the whole of postcolonial theory. Postcolonial theory, he argues, essentializes cultures, painting them as fixed and static categories. Moreover, it presents the difference between East and West as unbridgeable, hence denying people's «universal aspirations» and «universal interests». He also criticized the postcolonial tendency to characterize all of Enlightenment values as Eurocentric. According to him, the theory will be remembered for its revival of cultural essentialism and its acting as an endorsement of Orientalism, rather than being an antidote to it. Topic. Fixation on national identity The concentration of postcolonial studies upon the subject of national identity has determined it is essential to the creation and establishment of a stable nation and country in the aftermath of decolonization, yet indicates that either an indeterminate or an ambiguous national identity has tended to limit the social, cultural, and economic progress of a decolonized people. In Overstating the Arab State 2001, by Nazi Ayubi, the Moroccan scholar Bin Abd al Ali proposed that the existence of a pathological obsession with identity is a cultural theme common to the contemporary academic field Middle Eastern studies. Nevertheless, Kumaraswamy and Sadiki said that such a common sociological problem that of an indeterminate national identity among the countries of the Middle East is an important aspect that must be accounted in order to have an understanding of the politics of the contemporary Middle East. In the event, Ayubi asks if what bin Abd al-Ali sociologically described as an obsession with national identity might be explained by the absence of a championing social class? Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Foundation works. Le Proces de la colonisation française French colonisation on trial 1924, by Nguyen A. I. Kwok known as Ho Chi Minh Discourse on colonialism 1950, by Amy Césaire Black Skin, White Masks 1952, by France Fanon The Wretched of the Earth 1961, by France Fanon The Colonizer and the Colonized 1965, by Albert Memmi Consciencism 1970 by Kwame Nkrumah Orientalism 1978 by Edward Said Can the Subaltern Speak 1988 by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak Topic <laughs> <laughs> Postcolonial Literature Topic <laughs> Contemporary authors of postcolonial fiction Chinwa Achebe Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie Ama Atta Adu Mariama Bar Gianina Brashi Edwidge Danticat 1969 Bucci Emecheta 1944 to 2018 Amitav Ghosh 1956 Mosen Hamid 1971 Jamaica Kincaid 1949 Jumpa Lahiri 1967 Ben Okri 1959 Michael Ondatya 1943 Arundhati Roy, 1961; Jean Rees, 1890 to 1979; Salman Rushdie, 1947; Sam Selvan, 1923 to 1994; Usman Sembine, 1923 to 2007; 
Babsi Sidwa, nineteen thirty eight Zadie Smith, nineteen seventy five Wale Soinka, nineteen thirty four Nugi W. A. Theongo, nineteen thirty eight Derek Walcott, nineteen thirty Post-colonial works of non-fiction until 2000 The Myth of the Lazy Native 1977, by Saeed Hussein Alatas. Imagined Communities, Reflections on the Origin and Spread of Nationalism 1983, 1991, by Benedict Anderson. London, Verso. ISBN 0-86091-329-5 The Empire Writes Back, Theory and Practice in Post-Colonial Literature 1990, by B. Ashcroft, G. Griffiths, and H. Tiffin. The Post-Colonial Studies Reader 1995, B. Ashcroft, G. Griffiths, and H. Tiffin, eds. London, Routledge ISBN 0-415-09621-9. Key Concepts in Postcolonial Studies 1998, B. Ashcroft, G. Griffiths, and H. Tiffin, eds. London, Routledge. Levrocentrisme Eurocentrism, 1988, by Samir Amin. The Heathen in His Blindness. Asia, the West, and the Dynamic of Religion. 1994, 2005, by S. N. Balagangadhara. ISBN 90-04-09943-3. The Location of Culture, 1994, H. K. Baba. The Postcolonial Question, 1996, I. Chambers and L. Kurti, eds. Routledge. Nation and Its Fragments Colonial and Postcolonial Histories, P. Chatterjee, Princeton University Press. Postcolonial Theory A Critical Introduction, 1998, by Leela Gandhi, Columbia University Press, ISBN 0 231 11273 4. Colonialism is Doomed, by Ernesto Guevara. Woman, Native, Other. Writing Postcoloniality and Feminism, Indiana University Press, 1989, German edition, trans. Katharina Menke, Vienna and Berlin, Verlag Turia and Kant, 2010. Japanese edition, trans. Kazuko Takemura, Tokyo, Iwanami Shoten, 1995, by Trin T. Min Hath Commonwealth, Comparative Literature and the World, Two Lectures, 1998, by Alamgur Hashmi. Islamabad, Gulmoha. African Philosophy, Myth and Reality, 1983, Paulin J. Houghton G. Feminism and Nationalism in the Third World 1986, by Kamari Jayawardena. Manichaean Aesthetics, The Politics of Literature in Colonial Africa 1988, A. Jan Mohamed. Inventing Ireland 1995, by Declan Kyberd. Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism 1916, by Lenin. Prospero and Caliban, The Psychology of Colonization Octave Manoni and P. Powsland. The Intimate Enemy, Loss and Recovery of Self Under Colonialism 1983, by Ashes Nandi. Traditions, Tyranny, and Utopias, Essays in the Politics of Awareness 1987, by Ashes Nandi. The Angel of Progress, Pitfalls of the Term Postcolonialism 1994, by Anne McClintock, in Colonial Discourse, Postcolonial Theory 1994, M. Baker, P. Hume, and M. Iverson, eds. Local Histories, Global Designs, Coloniality 1999, by Walter Mignolo. Infinite Layers, Third World? 1989, by Trin T. Min Ha. Under Western Eyes 1986, by Chandra Talpad Mohanty. The Invention of Africa 1988, by V. Y. Mudimbi. Dislocating Cultures 1997, by Uma Narayan. Contesting Cultures 1997, by Uma Narayan. Delusions and Discoveries 1983, B. Parry. Postcolonial Student, Learning the Ethics of Global Solidarity in an English Classroom, by Masood Ashraf Raja. Coloniality and Modernity, Rationality 1991, in Globalizations and Modernities 1999, by Anibal Quijano. 
Caliban, a punce sobre la cultura de nuestra América Caliban, Notes about the culture of our America, 1971, in Caliban and other essays 1989, by Roberto Fernández Retama Culture and Imperialism 1993, by Edward Said New Orientations, Post-Colonial Literature in English by Jadeep Sarangi, Orthospress, New Delhi Can the Subaltern Speak? 1988, by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. The Postcolonial Critic 1990, by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. Selected Subaltern Studies 1988, by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. A Critique of Postcolonial Reason, Towards a History of the Vanishing Present 1999, by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language in African Literature 1986, by Nugi W. A. Theongo. White Mythologies, Writing History and the West 1990, by Robert J. C. Young. Colonial Desire, Hybridity in Theory, Culture and Race 1995, by Robert J. C. Young. Postcolonial works of non-fiction after 2000 Cahiers du CEDREF on Decolonial Feminist and Queer Theories 2012, by Paula Bachetta Iran, A People Interrupted 2007, by Hamid Dabashi at the risk of being heard, Indigenous Rights, Identity, and Postcolonial States 2003, B. Dean and J. Levi, eds. University of Michigan Press. ISBN 0-472-06736-2. Postcolonial Theory. Eine Kritische Einführung. Postcolonial Theory, A Critical Inquiry, 2005, by N. Dewan. Beginning Postcolonialism 2010, by J. McLeod, 2nd edition, Manchester University Press. The Idea of Latin America 2005, by Walter Mignolo. The Postcolonial Ghetto 2010, by L. Paperson. Prem Podar and David Johnson, ed. 2008. A Historical Companion to Postcolonial Literatures in English. Edinburgh, Edinburgh University Press. ISBN 978-0-7486-3602-0. Retrieved 23 February 2016. The Disappointed Bridge, Ireland and the Post-Colonial World 2014, by Richard Pine New Digital Worlds, Post-Colonial Digital Humanities in Theory, Praxis, and Pedagogy 2018, by Rupika Rissam Postcolonial Theory and the Arab-Israeli Conflict 2008, ph. C. Salzman and D. Robinson Devine, eds. Routledge. Postcolonialism, an Historical Introduction 2001, by Robert J. C. Young. Presentations of Postcolonialism, New Orientations. 2007, Jadeep Sarangi, Orthospress, New Delhi. Coexisting Contemporary Civilizations, by G. Ankel. Geneva Inu Press, 2000 ISBN 2-88155-004-5. On the Postcoloni, 2000, by Achille Mombe. The Regents of the University of California. <laughs> Scholarly projects In an effort to understand postcolonialism through scholarship and technology, in addition to important literature, many stakeholders have published projects about the subject. Here is an incomplete list of projects. Bodies and Structure 2019, on the spatial history of Japan and its empire Chicana Diasporic 2018, a research hub that highlights the Chicana Caucus of the National Women's Caucus from 1973 to 1979 Harlem Shadows 2018, an open-source collection of Claude McKay's 1922 collection of poems Passamaquoddy People, at Home on the Oceans and Lakes 2014, a digital archive of photos and recordings of the Passamaquoddy People Postcolonial Writers Make Worlds 2017, critical reading of Black and Asian British literature 
Torn Apart, Separados 2018, Visualizations and Scholarly Journal Tracking Global Crisis Situations W. E. B. Du Bois's Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America 2019, Charts from W. E. B. Du Bois in Color About the Lives of Black Americans See also Ali Shariati Amina Wadad Audrey Lord Byrne. 1969, directed by Gillo Ponticorvo Cultural cringe Cross-culturalism Decolonization The Dogs of War 1980, directed by John Irvin Ethnology Fatima Mernesi An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, 1975, by Chinwa Achebe Inversion in postcolonial theory Layla Ahmed Linguistic imperialism Lila Abu Lakad Kimball Crenshaw Kesha Ali Nation Building Paolo Fryer Postcolonial anarchism Postcolonial feminism Postcolonial theology Postcommunism Ranajit Gua Ranjit Hoskote Robert J. C. Young Saba Mahmood Talal Assad Teju Cole, The White Saviour Industrial Complex, The Atlantic